everyone, and welcome back to Straight A Nursing. Thank you so much for listening in today. And before we get started, I want to go over a few ground rules. Yes, there are ground rules if you're listening to my podcast. First of all, if you're sitting at your desk right now, I want you to put this thing on pause. Go get your earbuds, get your sneakers on, and get outside and go for a walk. If that's not feasible, then Think about something that has been hanging over your head, maybe around the house. Get up and go do that thing. Clean out a closet. Do the laundry. Put the dishes away. Do something productive with this time, either for your fitness or for your peace of mind, keeping your home and life running smoothly, so that you're maximizing your time and getting your life back. That's why I made this podcast to help free you from the chains of your desk so you could study, review while getting your life back on track. The only exception is if you are commuting. That's okay. That's actually really excellent use of your commute time. So that's the rule. So if you're not ready, get ready and come back. Okay, so now everybody's doing something productive and good for you, right? Excellent. Next, I wanted to make a quick announcement. If you've been following the Straight A Nursing website, you know that we are regularly adding to our list of available products and resources. So if you go to the website and you go to the shop banner across the top, you're going to see some really handy electrolyte reference sheets that are so awesome. You guys will love them. And then I'm also adding in more premium study guides. So their free study guides slash notes are still up on the website. They're good. They're real good, actually. But the premium ones blow them away. Concepts are expanded on. There's updated information with new knowledge and research, and a little bit more of a call out here and there. Here's what you really need to focus on. So check those out. So as of right now, cardiovascular is up and renal is up, and there will be more added soon so that by the time we get through this month, which is August 2017, there should be a whole core set for Med Surge 1 available, and we just keep adding as we go. And eventually, we'll have everything for Med Surge 1, Med Surge 2, PEDS, OB, mental health, etc. And today, what we are talking about are respiratory disorders for Med Surge 1. So these are your basic respiratory disorders. We won't get into mechanical ventilation. ABG interpretation or any of that. We're going to save that for another day. But for now, just that basic respiratory pathophysiology, nursing care, things you need to know for Med Surge 1. So basically, what we're going to talk about and touch on today is uh, asthma, COPD, and I believe pneumonia, kind of the three big ones that you'll see in the acute care setting. So first, let's talk a little bit about asthma. So what this is, is basically, it's a very common disease. Many of you may actually have and suffer from asthma, and I feel for you. It looks like just a terrifying, stressful disease to live with, especially when there's an exacerbation. So this is a disease of the bronchial airways. It's going to be characterized by reversible bronchospasm, mucosal edema, lots of mucus production, and airway inflammation. So even though I say that it's a reversible bronchospasm, note that People still die of asthma attacks, right? Sometimes that bronchospasm and that inflammation and all of that can just get so bad that the airway closes off, which is why I think asthma would be one of the scariest things to have. And big props to those of you that manage to go on about your lives with this hanging over your head all the time. I'd be a nervous wreck, but mad respect to you guys. So... um It's really, really important that your patient that has asthma understands their treatment plan, and we will go into that a little bit more later on when we talk about treatments. It's often inherited, but it's also, you know, it can just happen from environmental factors, those irritants in the air, like pollen, uh, mold, 
even animal dander, which is really sad. Uh, people with asthma often cannot have pets. I feel so bad for them. Uh, smoke, pollution, things like that. I even read somewhere that even cockroaches have something to do with um, being an asthma irritant. Exercise induced asthma is a thing. Abrupt changes in temperature going from a very hot day to a very cold environment or vice versa. Strong odors, which is why we do not want anyone wearing cologne or perfume in the hospital because you could trigger an already sensitive patient's asthma attack, uh, beta blockers, aspirin, being um, excitatory states, things like that. So lots of things can trigger asthma. So let's talk just briefly about the pathophysiology. There are two kinds of reactions. There's an early phase and a late phase reaction. In the early phase reaction, and when we say early phase, we mean that the reaction occurs very, very soon after the exposure those beta lymphocytes are going to produce immunoglobulin E, which is IgE, and these IgE antibodies will attach to mast cells and basophils in those bronchial walls, and then these, these inflammatory mediators are released. So these mediators are going to lead to edema and the bronchoconstriction, which are really the core key components of an asthma attack. So those bronchioles are narrowed, the expiratory air, you can't exhale, so the air gets trapped, and the alveoli hyperinflate. So a lot of times with asthma, they'll teach, you know, the patient to try to really get that air out. And you'll notice that asthma patients, when they're having an exacerbation, will have that prolonged expiratory phase. And I don't know if teach them to get the air out is the right the right word, um, but the um, teach them to take their inhalers so that they can breathe appropriately. There you go. A late phase reaction is going to be this delayed reaction, and that's going to present the same clinically as an early phase, but it's going to occur hours after the exposure, which in the case of a late phase reaction, it can make it difficult to trigger or to identify the trigger. So again, the clinical manifest manifestations of an asthma attack are classic, the shortness of breath, the increased respiratory effort, maybe nasal flaring, that prolonged expiration, you are going to hear expiratory wheezes, coughing, and then cyanosis would be a late sign. So here's a little tip. This might come up on a test. If your patient has an asthma attack and they're wheezing and then they're all of a sudden not, don't think, oh, they made it. They're past their attack. Suddenly not wheezing anymore can often be a sign that the airway is completely closed. So you want to keep a careful eye on their lung sounds and match that information with what you're seeing clinically going on with the patient, right? You never go off just one sign or symptom. So asthma is diagnosed based on lots of different things, uh, lung tests, their clinical manifestations, chest x-rays, the IgE we mentioned earlier that would be uh, viewable in a blood test. There's allergy tests, CBC with differentials. So what are we going to see with these different things? So spirometry, spirometry, that's hard to say, that's a pulmonary function test. And so these people will be seeing a pulmonologist most likely to manage their disease. And um, though, I don't know, maybe a lot of primary care physicians deal with asthma as well. But pulmonologist is definitely someone who would administer a pulmonary function test. And that's going to measure the amount of air moving in and out after the patient's taken a deep breath. So a patient with asthma is going to have their expiratory flow rate is going to be low. Their forced expiratory volume is going to be low, as is their forced vital capacity. Now, their functional residual capacity will be elevated, as will their total lung capacity and residual volume. So this increase in the residual capacity, total lung capacity, and residual volume are all due to air being trapped in the lungs. Okay, so does that make sense? So your chest x-ray, what do you think that's going to show? If there's air trapping in the lungs all the time, you're going to see areas of hyperinflation, and they can compare chest x-rays over time to monitor the progress of the disease. 
The IgE blood test will show a rise in the IgE levels when there's an allergic reaction happening. Obviously, allergy tests, just like anything, are going to just show you what you're allergic to, which can help patients steer clear of things that they should steer clear of. You know, people even move to different parts of the country because of pollen sensitivities. And then um, CBC is going to show eosinophils when there's an allergic reaction. And that knowing about the eosinophils is key. It's going to be on a test. Guarantee you eosinophil, think allergy. So asthma is classified by the severity and the frequency of the symptoms. Um, not a ton you need to know here, really. It's just how it's labeled. Um, the most important one that you need to know is status asthmaticus, and that is the patient's having a severe life-threatening attack that is not responding to medication. And that's the patient that I see in the intensive care unit, is the patient in status as. Maticus. So when we do the advanced med surge respiratory lecture, we'll talk about all the cool things we do for asthma patients in an intensive care setting. But how is asthma treated on a day-to-day basis? So the main goal with asthma, obviously, prevention is key, right? We're really going to try to prevent exacerbations And then when airway spasm does occur, we obviously want to reverse it as quickly as possible. So a treatment's considered effective if the patient can maintain their normal life. You know, it would be awful to have to curtail your activities that you love because of asthma. So we want them to be able to go on about their life. We want to have normal lung function as much as we can. We want to have as few side effects from the medication. Makes perfect sense, right? So basically, it's this two-pronged approach. Control inflammation, which is going to prevent exacerbations, and when inflammation occurs, try to get it down, and then reversing the spasm. So what do we do to reverse the spasm? A few different things. We could give beta agonists, okay? So these stimulate the beta adrenergic, I can never say this word, beta adrenergic receptors, and that's going to dilate the airway. So an example of that is albuterol. And in the hospital, we call it all betterol because patients will often think they need a breathing treatment. A lot of times people have anxiety, especially patients with COPD and asthma can imagine ever, ever, ever not feeling like I couldn't breathe. So understandably so, these people have a sense, heightened sense of anxiety around their respiratory function and ability. So that anxiety gets ramped up during times of illness, even if they're in the hospital for something totally different. And, you know, they want a breathing treatment all the time. So we call it all better all because you give them the breathing treatment and they're all better. Um, Though I'm not belittling albuterol. It is an excellent drug and it does help. So reversing the spasm, we can also give nebulized atropine. That's going to be an anticholinergic that will block the parasympathetic nervous system. We also want to control inflammation. IV steroids are used. So if your patient's really sick, they're going to be getting like solumedrol IV to help get that inflammation down. Um, Also, inhaled corticosteroids. So this is something that someone would be on uh, chronically, you know, at home. This is going to prevent the mast cells from emptying and dumping all that stuff out. It'll help reduce edema and spasm. So some common ones are Pulmacort, Flovent, and flutic- Fluticazone. I probably butcher drug names. You know how you never hear anyone say them until the drug rep comes by the hospital? So you have it in your head the way that it's said, and then you hear somebody like a pharmacist who knows what they're talking about say it, and it's completely different. So anyway, uh, controlling inflammation, you can also give a mast cell stabilizer to suppress the release of bronchoconstrictive substances, and chromalin is an excellent example of that. And then controlling inflammation, so these would be your um, leukotriene modifiers to block the action of the leukotrienes, and Singular is uh, a good example of one of those. So your patient will typically be on more than one kind of inhaler at home. They need to understand what type and when to use it and when to seek medical care. So basically, their asthma treatment regimen is going to consist of a long-term med and one that provides immediate relief when they flare up. 
So your long-term daily med is going to be, you know, your leukotriene modifier, like your Singulair, the chromalin sodium, which was the mast cell stabilizer, the inhaled corticosteroids, you know, that was again, the Flovent, the Sympacort. And then there's combo drugs like Advair that have a bit of a corticosteroid along with the long-acting bronchodilator. So these are going to be used to help keep that inflammation under control on a day-to-day preventative kind of basis. And then when there's an attack, you know, the asthma patient feels an attack coming on, the drugs that they're going to want are the short-acting beta-2 agonists. So this is the albuterol, the Zopinex, tributylene, and the anticholinergics, which is the atrovent. So you might be wondering, why beta-2 agonists? How do they work? Well, these are going to work because they relax smooth muscle that lines the airway. And this can, you know, it's going to decrease that... uh, bronchoconstriction. It'll last about three to six hours-ish, but um, note that they do not decrease the overall inflammation. Um, Anticholinergics are often used, but it's typically going to be used in conjunction with the beta-2 agonist as they don't work as quickly. And a lot of times patients with exercise-induced asthma, you might see them taking a puff on their inhaler before they even do any exercise. That's because it can help because they know they're going to have an asthma situation. This can just open things up so that they can exercise safely. So how are we going to take care of a patient with asthma? Um, Definitely the very first thing that you will do with a patient with asthma is assess them thoroughly. So you want to see how short of breath they are. You're going to listen to their lungs. Have them rate their shortness of breath on a scale of 1 to 10. Any asthma patient is going to be super clued in to their level of shortness of breath. You can also listen to them talk. Are they speaking in full sentences or only three-word sentences? Again, do you hear wheezes? Do you not hear wheezes? You'll also want to get a medical history, find out what meds they take, what allergies they have. Have they been around anything potentially that could cause an asthma attack? What were they doing? What's triggered attacks in the past? Recently had a patient who was in status asthmaticus and they had been... um, I don't know why they did this, but they had been around a bonfire and bam, that smoke, that irritant was enough to send them into a severe, severe asthma attack. They ended up doing just fine. But just so you know, um, sometimes, you know, there's pollutants out there and it's hard to avoid them all the time. So your nursing diagnoses and interventions for asthma, ineffective breathing pattern would be a really good one to choose as a nursing diagnosis, you're going to give the NEB treatments. And when we say NEB treatments, we're talking about nebulized medication. That's the albuterol and Zopinex and all of those. You'll give oxygen and you want them to be in a position of comfort. Typically for an asthma patient, it's going to be a semi-Fowler's position, definitely upright. Impaired gas exchange would be another good one for impaired gas exchange. Get some O's on them. Monitor their lung sounds. Monitor their SpO2. Watch their skin. Look for signs of cyanosis. You're going to see it first probably around the lips, uh, maybe a little bit around the fingertips if they have lighter skin. Risk for anxiety related to air hunger. Again, that anxiety, huge. And you cannot sweep it under the rug. You cannot ignore it. It is a very, very real anxiety. And the best thing that I do when my patients are having asthma exacerbation is I am just as calm as can be. And everything is fine. Here's this. Here's your oxygen. Here's the call You call me if you need anything. I don't ever make it. Okay, I know I sounded kind of goofy there. But my point is, I don't ever let my panic show through because that is going to send somebody who's heightened anxiety off the rails. So I'm just as calm as butter. Um, And by being calm yourself and encouraging the patient to stay calm, you really kind of change the atmosphere in that room to one of you know, serenity a little bit as much as possible. You're going to be that reassuring presence. Okay. You're going to give oxygen and keep the patient apprised. They are very clued in to things like their SpO2 sats and, and, you know, the things that you're seeing on the monitor. So let them know, you know, every now and then I'll just say, just, you know, your O2 sats, 97%. I'm hearing, you know, your wheezes are getting better. I'm hearing more air movement. Just letting them know that they're improving can really keep that anxiety from spinning out of control. 
So there is a little bit about asthma. I hope that was super interesting for you guys. Let's move on to COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Super common. Really, really, really common. I cannot tell you enough. I would say probably one in four patients that I see in the ICU at least has a history of COPD. So it is a combination of disorders that are going to affect the air moving in and out of the lungs. So it's a combo of asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis, which is this kind of culmination of things that affect air movement. Current thinking maybe says that this is caused by long-term exposure to things. Uh, Mainly cigarette smoke would be the big one. So we've already talked about asthma being, you know, a respiratory disorder. Let's talk about emphysema. And uh, I believe we go into chronic bronchitis a little bit as well. So emphysema, um, in emphysema, the walls of the alveoli and the space between them are destroyed. So you get this permanent kind of overinflation of the lungs. The air passages get obstructed. There's loss of... uh, recoil in the in the lungs there's increased ventilatory dead space they get blebs and partial airway collapse so it's pretty darn serious so your patient with emphysema is going to show the following signs they're going to have dyspnea on exertion that just gets worse the more exerted they get and as time goes on their ap diameter of the chest will be increased so if you haven't learned about the ap diameter you will in your assessment class but just note that this is basically like a big round barrel chest and then they'll have hyper resonance when the chest is percussed and You'll also have this chest x-ray. The diaphragm will look very flattened on a chest x-ray. That's because of overinflation. Uh, you could have an enlarged heart and right ventricle. You will look at their fingers and look for clubbing, which is a sign of chronic hypoxia. And you also look for cyanosis, which would be a terrible thing to see. And uh, you might even have some peripheral pitting edema due to increased pressures in the lungs. So when the lung pressures are up, the fluid doesn't go into the lung like it's supposed to because the pressures are too high. So it backs up into the periphery and you get that peripheral pitting edema. So those are some things that you're going to see with your patient with emphysema. And then for chronic bronchitis, this involves the inflammation of the airways. And it also involves an increased mucus production. So the air is not going to move in and out as effectively as it should. And the main cause for chronic bronchitis is, guess, yes, cigarettes or cigarette smoke, which I realize not everybody who has smoke-related lung disease smokes. Secondhand smoke is a deal, a real deal. Um, But anyway, it can cause that. So your patient with chronic bronchitis is going to have shortness of breath. They'll have a cough with lots of sputum. They'll be coughing up a bunch of stuff. They won't really be able to exercise. Their shortness of breath will get too bad. They'll have a prolonged expiration, just like a patient with asthma would and wheezing. So you'll hear that. They will have hypoxemia and hypercapnia. And they will have frequent lung infections. So let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the complications of COPD. And they're going to have... A really hard time staving off any kind of a respiratory infection. So they're going to have frequent uh, pneumonias, basically, and they aren't going to have a lot of reserves. So when they get a pneumonia, they're going to go downhill pretty fast and probably have to be hospitalized, maybe even go to the ICU for that. Uh, Because of bleb formation and the hyperinflated state of the lungs, they can have spontaneous pneumothorax. So if your patient with COPD shows up with, you know, absent breath sounds on one side and severe shortness of breath, be very suspicious that they've had a spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, Again, anxiety with COPD patients, um, very high very understandable. Um, I've noticed a lot that COPD patients, you know, their anxiety is, you're dealing with that almost as much as you're dealing with their airway issues. And you just have to kind of keep that in mind that anything that happens to them is going to be extra heightened by how anxious they are. And then if you remember that hypoxia, 
one of the first signs of hypoxia is getting really agitated. So your patient could be pretty uh, restless, active, not cooperating. Maybe they're pulling off their leads, pulling off their gown, pulling off their oxygen, which is just, why would you do that? Um, and then what's going to happen is they'll probably eventually become hypercapnic as their CO2 levels rise, 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 and then they're somnolent. So if you've got a patient who's going wild and you suspect that they're hypoxic and then all of a sudden they're calm and you're not hearing any activity from their room, be very suspicious that they are now hypercapnic and you have got to intervene. So how are we going to care for a patient with COPD? Well, um, basically, we're going to improve ventilation. We're going to get those secretions out and prevent complications. And one thing that you might hear when we're talking about a patient with COPD is that they are a member of the 50-50 club. And if your respiratory therapist or one of the nurses says, oh, he's in the 50-50 club, you'll probably wonder what the heck they're talking about. So when we talk about the 50-50 club, this means that when you take an ABG on a patient with COPD, their PaO2 will be around 50. Note that normal is 80 to 100, and we'll get into ABG interpretation more in our advanced med surge, but just as like, just a little look at this so you know what it is. So their PaO2 will be around 50, and their CO2 will also be around 50, where normal for CO2 is 35 to 45. So obviously, these numbers are out of whack. And why aren't we getting excited about it? Well, if someone's in the 50-50 club, they have COPD, okay, and they are chronically like this. Their body has adjusted to compensate for this high CO2 and this low oxygen. So we look at ABGs a little differently in patients with COPD and have different parameters for treatment. Mm -hmm. So treating the patient with COPD is going to focus on improving ventilation. So that's giving drugs like bronchodilators, anticholinergics, corticosteroids. Uh, theophylline is used occasionally. It's more of an old school drug. And of course, oxygen. Uh, sometimes that's just um, as simple as a nasal cannula. Sometimes it's a mass. Uh, often it's a non-rebreather. And sometimes, um, I'm sorry, not a non-rebreather. I'm thinking a BiPAP. Up in BiPAP if their CO2 is really high. So BiPAP is super annoying. I've never worn it. I've talked to people who've tried it on and they say they cannot tolerate it. So imagine that this mask, which forces air into your lungs, is placed on your face and it blows pretty pretty strongly, um, you already have anxiety. So it's going to be, it's often a challenge to get COPD patients to wear their BiPAP FYI. Um, if they've got that hypoxia induced agitation, that makes it even worse. So if your patient's been taking off their BiPAP, refusing their BiPAP, and then suddenly they are somnolent, it's because again, their COT got a little high. Now you can get the BiPAP on because they're not fighting you. Get that BiPAP on. Their CO2 will level out, and guess what? They'll come around, and they'll want to take the BiPAP off. So it's just kind of a cyclical thing that happens in the hospital. You're also going to remove secretions. Giving bronchodilators helps with that. Pulmonary hygiene, chest physiotherapy, positioning, all those things. Basically, focusing on loosening up those secretions and getting that gunk up, coughing it up, getting it out. And also preventing complications. So that comes with any kind of nursing intervention, right? So what are our nursing diagnoses and interventions for COPD? Well, a good one would be ineffective airway clearance. We're going to give meds to loosen secretions, encourage fluids to keep the secretions loose. We're going to give pulmonary hygiene, teach them to cough and deep breathe. And sitting in high fowlers typically is going to work pretty well for them. Impaired gas exchange is another one. We can give the bronchodilators for that, some low flow oxygen or BiPAP as needed. If you're putting BiPAP on your patient, they cannot be restrained and they have to be alert enough to be able to take it off themselves. If they are nauseous, we're not going to put BiPAP on. If the patient vomits while wearing BiPAP, it's going to force the emesis down their airway. So BiPAP does come with a whole bunch of safety concerns.
We're going to monitor pulse oximetry and lung sounds for that impaired gas exchange. Anxiety, again, another one. Provide that reassuring presence. If you stay calm, it helps the patient stay calm. We'll teach some effective breathing techniques, but you're going to check for readiness to learn first. Lots of NCLEX questions are going to try to trick you into teaching the patient pursed lip breathing at the height of their COPD exacerbation. They are not in a position to learn right now. You're going to wait until the exacerbation has passed and teach them how to do it for next time. You also, you know, explain what you're doing and encourage questions. Activity and tolerance is another big one. You're going to provide rest periods, cluster your care, and monitor for increased respiratory effort when they are doing any kind of mobilization. And then often patients with COPD will have imbalanced nutrition less than body requirements. That's because all that respiratory effort uses up a lot of calories. So you want to teach them to, and it's often hard for them to eat large meals because they they just get so tired. So you'll encourage small, frequent, high calorie meals, um, encouraging that nutritional intake, get with dietary, get some supplements going, and instruct the patient to take rest periods while they eat. Okay, so that's COPD. Let's talk a little bit about pneumonia. Uh, this is a very common diagnosis that you'll see in the inpatient setting. It is basically an inflammatory process in the lung parenchyma, which results in lots of fluids, you know, increased fluid in the interstitial space and the alveoli. So it has lots of causes, bacteria, fungal pneumonias are notoriously difficult to treat, viruses, and aspiration of a foreign substance. So I would say bacterial and aspiration are the two most common that I see. Risk factors include um, smoking or history of smoking. That's just going to damage the lungs, make them not work as well. Lung cancer, COPD, any kind of history of infections. Immobility is a huge risk factor. Being intubated is a huge risk factor and just being older. So what's the patho of pneumonia? So the first step in the pneumonia pathophysiology is going to be some offending agent, a virus, a piece of ham that your patient aspirated, whatever it is. So the lungs then initiate an inflammatory response, which disrupts their ability to cough effectively. And remember that cilii, is that the plural of cilia, cilia, I can't remember. Anyway, that motility is going to be greatly reduced. So things don't get pushed up and out of the lungs as they should. Also, those inflamed alveolar sacs, which, as you recall, in pneumonia are full of fluid, are not going to participate in normal gas exchange. So you then have exudate in the alveoli consolidating, which further impairs gas exchange. So um, you got a lot of bad things here that cause the common signs and symptoms being fever, chills and sweats, okay, any kind of infection is going to cause that, chest pain with breathing, a headache even, productive cough, even some hemoptysis, obviously dyspnea and fatigue. So treating the pneumonia patients, obviously, obviously it's going to have to do with what is causing their pneumonia. You know, if it's a bacterial, they'll get antibiotics. If it's a fungal pneumonia, they'll be on um, antifungals or antiviral meds, whatever caused it. And then many patients who are hospitalized with pneumonia will need oxygen support. You know, it could be a nasal cannula, a couple liters, few liters, or they could be intubated. They'll probably also be getting nebulized bronchodilators, and you'll want to keep everything else optimized, their nutrition, their fluid status, their electrolytes. Uh, patients who are not intubated and have a weak cough and can't get those secretions out may need nasotracheal suctioning or NT suctioning, which is, I would say, my top five list of things that I don't like to do. But it is also one of the top three things you can do quickly to save someone's life. So NT suctioning and then intubated patients will need frequent, not necessarily frequent, but uh, a fair amount of suctioning to keep their lungs clear. You don't want to over suction because then you can cause irritation to the lungs. So what are some nursing diagnoses for our patient with pneumonia? Ineffective airway clearance. So again, loosening secretions, 
with meds and fluids, pulmonary hygiene, again, that cough, deep breathe, and sitting in high fowlers is going to help them a lot. They may have an ineffective breathing pattern. Um, It hurts, right? Pneumonia is painful. So teaching them to splint their chest wall will help when they're coughing to get that pain under control so they can cough. And you'll monitor for increased work of breathing, shortness of breath, drop in O2 sats with exertion, things like that. Activity intolerance, providing rest periods, again, watching for that decreased O2 sat, clustering care, and gradually increasing activity as their respiratory function gets better. So how can we prevent pneumonia? Preventing pneumonia is huge in the hospital setting. Um, It's a hospital-acquired condition that we try very, very hard to avoid. And here's what we do. First things first, good hand hygiene. Across the board, good hand hygiene in the hospital setting can prevent so many problems. You want to encourage fluid intake in your patient who can handle fluids to keep the secretions loose so that they can be coughed up effectively. Will you, um, you'll also be paying attention to repositioning your patient every two hours if they cannot do it themselves. You will encourage them to cough deep breathe. If you have to control pain, you have to control pain in order to get them to cough deep breathe. You want to reduce their risk of aspiration sitting up for eating and drinking. If their ability to swallow is a little iffy, then you want to get an official um, speech therapy swallow evaluation. And you will give the pneumonia vaccine to people when they come in. And then um, if they're on a ventilator, we work really hard to increase ventilator acquired pneumonia. And there's kind of a bundle of things that go with this. And it's head of bed at 30 to 45 degrees. Oral care with chlorhexidine. Um, Depending on your facility, it might be oral care Q2 hours. Um, Since we started using the chlorhexidine, it's oral care Q4 hours. But just know that for your exams, just go by whatever your professor says. It might be Q2. Um, Daily evaluation for extubation along with a daily sedation vacation if they can tolerate it. And subglottal suctioning above the cuff, you want to keep secretions from just sitting atop the cuff. That's just gross when you think about it. And again, hand hygiene and gloves whenever you're touching anything having to do with the vent. Okay, and then let's see. That is it for pneumonia. Awesome. And then let's talk real quick about atelectasis. And we will be pretty much done with this segment. So um, you will hear atelectasis referred to a lot. Um, This is a condition in which the lungs are not fully expanding and the alveoli are collapsed. So typically it's due to a lack of deep breathing caused in the hospital setting by lots of things, immobility, pain, respiratory depressing drugs like fentanyl maybe, being on a ventilator, or being paralyzed. So lots of different things can cause it. could also have atelectasis from a blockage of the airway, mucus plugs, foreign body aspiration, even lung cancer can contribute. So mostly in the inpatient setting, it's going to be due, and what you're going to be tested on and, and grilled about is probably due to lack of cough, deep breathe, and immobility would be the main reasons I see it happening. Um, The signs and symptoms, you're going to have low-ish O2 sats. So if your patient's been 97% and now they're 91%, 91% is still above 90, right? So technically it's considered normal, but that's a pretty good drop. You'd want to go in and listen to their lungs, get them to cough, take some deep breaths, clear those lungs out, pop those alveoli back open. You'll hear crackles upon deep inspiration. This kind of sounds like Rice Krispies, but very faintly. Um, This sound occurs when the alveoli pop open um, with that deep breath in. So you want to really encourage that deep inspiration. And that's what that incentive spirometer is designed to do, the little contraption at the bedside that the patients all ignore. Also, uh, low-grade fever, Some studies don't support this, but I tend to see it most of the time. So a low-grade fever along with that. So how do you treat atelectasis? Uh, Usually it's, like I said, a result of pain, 
immobility and a lack of just this coughing and deep breathing, especially after surgery. So the first treatment is let's encourage coughing and deep breathing. Get that incentive spirometer out. Make sure they understand how to use it. it I think people's initial um, kind of gut instinct with that thing is to blow into it. So you really need to teach them to pull the air in. So I tell them it's like sucking a milkshake, a really thick milkshake up through a straw. If the patient's in pain after surgery, they don't want to take deep breaths. They're going to be big babies about it, but you need to get them coughing and breathing. So get their pain treated and then get them to cough and deep breathe. And one of the best ways to get a patient after surgery or who's in pain to take deep breaths is to increase their mobility. But again, you got to treat the pain so that you can increase mobility and then they can breathe. If uh, the cause of the atelectasis is uh, a cancer, a tumor, or a mucus plug, removing the uh, tumor is a treatment. Getting the mucus plug out through a uh, bronchoscopy, that's the treatment. If they inhaled a piece of ham, get that out of there. Um, you want to figure out what's causing the atelectasis and then fix the underlying problem. Um, but again, for the most part, it's caused by failure to cough, deep breathe. Super simple nursing intervention to get your patient to do it. Find out why they're not coughing, deep breathing, and go from there. So that is, I think, enough for today. That was a um, pretty good overview of some of the basic things you need to know for MedSurge 1 regarding uh, the most common respiratory disorders that you see. So I hope you rock your respiratory exam and all your questions about that topic. And if you have not yet been to the website, I invite you to visit straightanursingstudent.com. You will find a plethora of information for you about a variety of topics for nursing students. The most recent blog post was about six really annoying things about nursing school and what you're going to do about them. So that's the latest. And the next one coming up is why study groups are a complete waste of time and how you can make them work for you. So that's just an example of some of the topics that are on the website. There's also a ton of topics that are just straight knowledge-based pathophysiology, nursing interventions, and the like. You'll find a ton of stuff there. You can also follow on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash straight A nursing student. And then on Twitter at straight A nurse. All kinds of fun things happening on Twitter. I learned something new on Twitter the other day. This is why I follow a lot of nurses and doctors and pharmacists. And I learned that Pepsid I don't know if it's all forms of Pepsid or just IV Pepsid. I need to look into that. But Pepsid can increase delirium. So good little pharmacology fact for you guys. Okay, have a great day. And I hope that you enjoyed your walk, right? Or your run or taking your dog out or reorganizing a closet or sewing a tote bag or putting the dishes away or making dinner or whatever you did with this time or you had a safe commute to wherever you're going. So check back in next week for another podcast from Straight A Nursing. Bye, guys. This podcast is brought to you by StraightAnursingStudent.com. Copyright Mo Media.